Hello, welcome to World Dairy Expo. Uh, I'm Tom Brunig with SCR Dairy, and we're happy to sponsor today Reproductive Performance with Automatic Activity Meters. The speaker today is Stephen LeBlanc, professor at University of Guelph. LeBlanc is an associate professor in the Department of Population Medicine at Ontario Veterinarian College at the University of Guelph. He received his bachelor's in animal science from McGill University and a DVM and Doctor of Veterinary Science from the University of Guelph. After five years of private practice, he joined the faculty at Guelph where he teaches veterinarian and agricultural students and provides clinical farm services. His research focuses on transition dairy cow metabolic and reproductive health and management. This seminar has been approved for continuing education credits from the American Registry of Professional Animal Science and the American Association of Veterinarian State Boards race program. Forms are available in the back in the table just outside this room if you're interested in race credits. I'd like to ask everyone to please silence their phones. And at this time, uh, Professor LeBlanc. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom, and, and thanks all for uh, taking time away from the show and the trade fair to, to come and uh, uh, listen to this seminar. Um, my background in, in this area is uh, that we've started to do some research in this, which I'll, I'll share with you in a few minutes. And uh, I come from a land of small herds, but where, as a relative proportion, we're seeing a huge increase in the adoption of so-called precision farming technologies, including things like robotic milking, um, but in particular automatic uh, activity monitors from a, a variety of suppliers. And so this, this is really something that's growing fast. And one of the themes that will go through my talk today is that um, to some extent, uh, some of these technologies are, are almost ahead of our ability to completely understand how to manage with them or at least how to take the data and use it to its fullest um, potential. So I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit as we go through as well. So we'll start uh, just by quick show of hands. How many of you are, are real live farmers who actually have a herd? Okay, and the rest of us are, are parasites. Okay. Um, <laughs> but th the thing is that um, reproduction is a, is a never ending subject. I chose well for a research interest because I'll probably never be out of work trying to figure out ways to efficiently and economically get cows pregnant. Because for those of you who are farmers, hands up, who's happy with their herds repro? Couldn't be better. Right, that's the answer I always get. Right? There's, it's, it's always a challenge. Um, and now we've got more tools coming to the table to help deal with that challenge. But just by way of, of starting, finding cows in heat is a, is a major, major problem. Um, for example, these are some data from Milo Wilt Bank here in Wisconsin from a number of years ago. Their research question for this was whether um, higher producing cows actually showed heat less well than lower producing cows and, and their conclusion was that yes in fact that was the case. Um, but the part I want to focus on is actually down here in the middle of, of the data. So they broke out these you know 300 uh, uh, cows into quite high producing, these were cows that were doing about 90 to 100 pounds versus not low but lower producing cows who from memory were doing about maybe 75 to 80 pounds of milk and um, they put heat watch on them so that they measured every time the cow got mounted, first time, last time, how many times and so on and were able to show that yeah, the higher producers um, had a shorter duration of estrus from the first mount to the last, had fewer mounts, and their total amount of time that they spent with another cow on their back was, was less. So, so that, that was that. But what I would draw your attention to are the actual numbers. Um, we're talking about cows that are in standing heat for six to maybe 11 hours on average with lots of variation. They actually got mounted six to nine times and the cumulative amount of time that they had another cow on their back, the cardinal sign of being in heat, was 22 seconds versus 28 seconds. So no wonder that when we're looking for something that happens in two to three second increments half a dozen times every three weeks, that that's hard to find. And so that's the ability of humans to find that with good observation is, is not very good. And so that's led us to look for tools to help to find cows and heat to know when to put semen in cows to, to, to make 
pregnant cows efficiently. And so synchronization programs are one tool that helps to achieve that, but increasingly now we've got more tools in the toolkit, including activity meters. So that's the heat um, expression and detection intensity side of the coin. Um, also, when and if we do find cows that are in heat, or at least that somebody thinks are in heat, based on um, detection of their behavior directly or indirectly, the truth is that about 5 to 20 percent of the time, we've got it wrong. They're not actually in heat, or at least they're far enough from being right in heat that the timing of insemination is probably not optimal. Um, somewhere between suboptimal and crappy. So whether that's in you know, the small herd tied up cows where you're relying on seeing slime or the cow that you know, doesn't let down her milk this morning, no, no wonder that that's not very accurate. Um, but even based on visual detection including some of those secondary signs or even based on seeing cows being mounted by another cow, there's still a certain amount of error involved with that. And, and so we're looking for tools that not only find cows in heat but find them accurate Accurately. They really are in heat and, and that it's close enough that we can know when to put the semen in the cows and that's a, not a huge window. All right, so the basic biology of it, which is now detectable with automated tools, is that for a cow to come into heat, show estrus, she needs to have low progesterone. The amount of progesterone um, pumping through her veins or coming out in her milk will drop because the corpus luteum on her ovaries that makes that progesterone has gone away. Whether it went away on its own or whether it went away because we gave her prostaglandin shot, progesterone has to drop and it drops about two days, 36, 48 hours before the cow is actually in heat. That allows her to come into standing heat which gives us something to aim at for detection. And so we can measure that with activity monitors. It's well known that cows become more restless, more active as they come into heat. That's detectable by pedometers or activity monitors and the peak of that activity um, is at or just before the cow actually ovulates. And the whole point of whether it's heat detection with your eyes, pedometers, or even sync programs is having an accurate prediction of when the cow is going to ovulate. Because if you know that, then you know when to put the semen in the cow. So that's the name of the game. So the next couple of slides are, are pretty basic background um, and then we'll actually get into some of the data. So Cow, this would be just a cow who happened to be wearing an activity monitor over about one, one and a half estrus cycles. So you can see she looks like she had a heat there because her activity measured in either steps or units of movement um, per hour or per two hours took a spike up. It bounces around day to day and within a day and then there's a very obvious spike, at least in the pretty graphs that everybody shows you in a, in a slideshow. Um, of course, they don't always look exactly that way in real life. But the point is that it's pretty repeatable that cows have this spike. And if we sort of put a magnifying glass on those data, the absolute amount of activity that a cow has when she's in heat jumps up considerably, several times what her normal baseline would be. And that lasts for a little less than 24 hours. Again, there's a variation around that, but typically somewhere in that 8, 12, maybe even up to 18 hours, you've got this um, noticeable movement up in terms of the cow's activity. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but it's each cow sort of has her own baseline level of activity and so you need to compare each cow to herself. It's not a question of saying if more than 200 steps or 100 units of movement that's a heat. It's looking for a deviation of the cow relative to herself. Okay so if we look at these data again similar type of thing just an example but it, it to illustrate the point and the concept um, you can see that each of these bars is, I think in these data, a two hour block of time through the cow's day. And you can kind of see that there's a somewhat repeatable pattern through the day. We'll go, get into that a little bit more, but cows don't, aren't equally active through a 24 hour cycle. 
And what we're looking for is a deviation of that cow relative to herself. And in ballpark numbers, that for a cow coming into heat, that's usually at least three standard deviations. So she's, you know, in the, in the top 1% uh, of, of the distribution of how active she might be otherwise, normally. And so you can see, again, just to illustrate the point here, occasionally cows will hit that threshold even when they're not in heat based on what's going on in their ovaries. So based on measuring progesterone or perhaps scanning their ovaries with an ultrasound unit. So occasionally, um, this isn't foolproof, there might be a false alarm. But conversely, uh, the clear cut heats, which is what most of them are and what we're looking for, are cows with a very obvious increase, nice, not too broadly based, a very high peak that's obvious and easy to see, um, and, and that would be the sort of classic textbook true estrus. Um, as I said a minute ago though, th there's a bunch of baseline variation. One cow's if you will, normal or non-estrous activity is not the same as another's. And so in essentially all of the commercial algorithms, they take each cow generates her own data. She makes her own rolling average, typically over about a week. And what the mathematics and the software are looking for is a deviation of that cow relative to herself. Not relative to her herd mates per se, not relative to some fixed number, but relative to herself. And again, just for, for context, typically a, a cow, at least in a clear, true heat, is going to have a two to five fold increase in her absolute activity and at least uh, double and, and often three, four, five standard deviations difference from what her average of the last week has been. And various algorithms, uh, essentially they all work off of that, but add some nuances into, uh, into exactly what number they compare to what to generate the practical list, which is this cow is in heat today. There have been a number of studies that have been done now to try to validate how well a variety of systems work at finding cows in heat. How efficient are they? In other words, if I had 100 cows that really had a heat, how many were found? And of the ones that were found, how many were actually in heat? Now, before I go further, um, what's a heat? Um, the, the gold standard by one measure would be the cow is in standing heat, she's got a beautiful clear slime to the floor and she's standing there with another cow on her back and she's not running away. That's a standing heat and, and that's, that's what we're after. Um, conversely, the gold standard against which these systems are compared for research is often either a progesterone test, so low means she's in heat, that's, that's accurate. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she actually went through a standing heat, okay? For example, the first postpartum heat a cow might ovulate but not show a heat. Or just speaking hypothetically, a cow might be lame and so she actually ovulated but she didn't strictly speaking show a heat because her foot was sore. Or in a small herd, there was no one to play with. She was the only cow in heat today, so there wasn't much for her to show. So what we're comparing to, you need to pay a little bit of attention to. In this example, essentially they were compared against blood progesterones, and we can see sensitivity, meaning if there were 100 cows that really did have a heat based on the blood test, how many of them were found um, and signaled by the system. The black numbers are those that were based just using the commercial algorithm as it was. The gray numbers were research projects where the researchers wrote their own math to, um, to identify the cows in heat. And so you can see in these ballpark figures, we're talking in the order of magnitude of 60 um, at the outside up to 90%. So it's not going to detect every single ovulation that happens in a cow or in a herd, uh, but it looks pretty good with some variation. Similarly for the specificities, mostly it looks like when a cow is signaled as being in heat, she probably really was. But again, there's some variation depending on whose algorithm and which mathematics were used and some of the other conditions of, of the study. One other thing to mention on this one is that there's really no evidence that I'm aware of that, a that uh, an activity monitor on the leg versus on the neck makes any difference. They, they look to be uh, about equally 
uh, well performing no matter where on the cow you attach it. Okay, there are, there's not a lot of actual commercial herd research done to say exactly how well do these systems work, are they the same or better, or how much better, or how do they differ from some of the other options for finding cows in heat or more generally for managing repro and knowing when to put semen in cows. So, so this is just a for instance from a single herd with not a ton of cows. Unfortunately, that's sort of the nature of a lot of these studies. I'll, I'll get to one that I hope is a little better. That's the one we did. But it, it wasn't um, on this level of, of asking a question about accuracy. So for instance, with a few grains of salt, if they went out and a person walked this freestall herd and devoted 10 minutes to doing nothing else but detecting heat five times a day, um, they detected just under 60% of the heats that happened. If they found a cow in heat, it was very likely, 93% chance, that indeed she was in heat based on their progesterone measurements, which are what they took as the gold standard. Um, other tools that you might consider using as a manager, you could glue a KMAR, so a heat mount detector to the cow's back. Um, that looked to be, under these conditions, equally uh, efficient at finding cows but less accurate, so there were some false positives, as you could imagine. And then what they did in this study that made it sort of interesting was they took two commercial systems and put them on the same cows at the same time. And so they had uh, the one system that was on the neck, the other system that was on the leg, and they looked at how well that did if you just had that and nothing else versus how that looked compared to if you supplemented it with some visual heat detection. And so they looked to be approximately equal and in the range of what would be achieved, again, in this herd, doesn't mean that's what it would be in your herd, um, with fairly intensive human observation. I think a point that's worth um, taking home is that there was apparently an, uh, an augmentation. You could do a little better with some supplementation of visual observation, at least in this herd. So what impacts how active cows are? What, I mean, you can imagine if you chase them around, they get more active. Um, but as I showed you in the first couple slides, there is a diurnal rhythm to this. Cows typically are less active in the middle of the night, from midnight till first activity in the barn. Typically, they're less active at that time of day. Um, you can obviously confound that. If you come in and milk, if you feed, if you move cows around, that's, that's going to shift that. So that's not an absolute thing. Um, one of the things that at least some of the algorithms in the software do is to, to compare not only just today against the average of the last week, but this time of day compared to this time of day um, over the previous days or previous week to try to, to smooth out or at least account for that background natural variation. Um, for what it's worth, typically first lactation animals are a little more active, other things being equal than older cows. And one thing that, that certainly seems to be repeatable is when you have more than one cow or two cows in the pen in heat at the same time, um, that rising tide lifts all the boats. They're, they're all a little more active. Perhaps more to the point, um, based on activity alarm, are, are there things that influence whether the cow's more likely to get pregnant when she's bred? And uh, again, there's, there's a lot we don't necessarily know about this, but one thing that did percolate up in a large study uh, in an intensive high production herd in Spain was that a greater relative increase at estrus was associated with a higher conception risk to that breeding. So in other words, if a cow had a really high peak, um, rel a big deviation, that was a positive thing. And, and at least in their data, th the higher the better. Different data, this time from uh, Ireland. One other thing that could help improve uh, the accuracy and by extrapolation, not from the data that they offered in this study, the, not only how high did a cow peak, but how long did she, was she above the threshold? Did she have a, an increased deviation? So this is showing that you've got a distribution of how long a cow has elevated activity um, when she's actually in heat. And so the average is somewhere in that 12-hour range. So they're, they're, they're in a, 
in, in the signal zone in a positive deviation um, that would say that the cow's in heat on average for around 12 hours, but that can go down to two and up to about 24. Most are clustered in that eight to 14 hour range. But what they showed that maybe a, a little practical tidbit is, um, this was pr these particular data were, were generated in two hour increments, which is fairly typical. If a cow only was above the threshold, only got signaled as being above the threshold um, for one two hour period, there was a fairly high chance that was a false positive, around 30%. And that dropped off quite steeply. If, if she showed as being in heat based on activity deviation um, for more than uh, six hours, the, the chances of her being a false positive were greatly reduced. Okay, the name of the game, whether it's heat detection, activity monitors, sync programs, or whatever, is knowing when to put semen in cows. And that does not change. These, all of these things are tools to know when to put semen in cows for a good shot at a pregnancy. So when a cow's in a standing heat, um, her brain secretes the hormone that makes her ovulate right around the beginning of standing heat. You can also do that with a shot of GnRH in a sync program. It doesn't really matter to the cow. The point is that after that, she's going to ovulate very predictably about 27, 28 hours later, and that egg that she ovulates is going to be good, fertile, for about eight hours. On the male side of things, when you put semen in a cow, whether it's straight out of the bull or out of the thawed straw, that semen is going to be viable for around 24 hours, maybe a little longer, but that's a pretty good working number. It takes three hours for the fastest swimmers to get upstream in, in the cow's reproductive tract, but they've kind of wasted their effort because they're not the ones who are going to fertilize the cow. It takes about eight or ten hours of, of final maturation of the sperm inside the cow, plus transit time, or including transit time, um, for, that, for the sperm to actually be fertile. So what we've got now on the male side is about a 14-hour window, give or take, of fertile male sperm, and we've got a, a window of about eight hours of a fertile egg from the cow, and the whole point of breeding management is to line those two things up. And so that goes right back to ancient history. Well, that's not that ancient, but a long time ago, um, where, pe where f it was figured out that by just looking at cows, it, the AMPM rule looked pretty good. If you saw a cow in heat in the morning, breed her in the afternoon, and so on. And that's working off of exactly what I just showed you. And fundamentally, that hasn't changed. If, if a cow um, gets the, the hormonal signal to ovulate from her brain or out of a bottle of GnRH, Either way, she's going to ovulate uh, 28 hours later, and you can work your timing off of that. And so this part is reasonably well worked out. Specific to activity monitors, you'd like to put, well, the, the timing of ovulation has been pretty well worked out. It's about 30 hours after the onset, so when that curve deviates up beyond normal variation, and it's on its way up, so that's the onset of increased activity. They're going to ovulate about 30 hours later, and then they quite rapidly ramp up to their peak of their activity, and, um, and they're going to ovulate um, near that time of, of peak activity. And so you'd like to put semen in cows, well, if you add up a bunch of research studies, six to 17 hours. The good news is that's a wide window. The bad news is that's a wide window. Um, so, you know, what is it, does it matter within there? Well, it looks like what you'd ideally like to do is about 12 hours after the onset of that increase in activity or at or soon after. The data would say, which I'll show you in a second, it's up to 16 hours, perhaps better yet within eight hours of peak. So that's pretty well worked out. The, the part that confounds it a little bit, though, is how do you actually use the data in the real world? You're not looking at the data constantly. You're not running out to breed the cow the second her activity goes up or the very moment she hits her peak. And so th that's where the, the practical question comes in a little bit of, you know, how often am I going to breed cows once a day, twice a day? How often am I responding to the signals coming out of the software? And so there's still a little bit of work to be done to optimize that. So, for, and again, there are not a ton of 
publish data to, to guide this from real world herds on large numbers of cows. Uh, these data from a conference a few years ago, these are with the, the SCR system. Um, four herds, uh, mostly in uh, Texas and elsewhere in the US, fairly large herds, and they just grabbed the data of when, when did the cow hit her peak activity and when was she inseminated. And you can see that um, breeding before their peak of activity, the conception risks were not that hot. At or within eight hours after, each bar is a different herd, so you can see that things vary from herd to herd, but across herds in that window from peak to eight hours later looked pretty good. Um, one herd tended to be different than the others, but they were up around that 45% um, probability of pregnancy per insemination. Uh, I think most people would be reasonably happy with that. Again, the, the little caveat is that's working off of the, the, the hour of peak, which is not necessarily exactly what people are looking at real time as they're getting data signals and, and deciding to, uh, to respond to them. Okay, so now into the meat of things. Um, with all these questions out there, we were interested in, in uh, looking at these options that producers have for managing repro in their herd and, and trying, as we could, to have a kick at the question, if I'm a producer and I got a choice of what I want to invest in or how I want to manage my herds, um, what could I expect in terms of performance if I went the activity route um, as a tool to manage my herd versus a sync program to manage my herd? Is one the same, better, or worse than the other? So, so that was our question. And I, I I'm sort of underline the word there based on. I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, the way we set this trial up reflected the reality of the herds, and this is reasonably common, um, certainly in our small to mid-sized Canadian herds. I, I think it's probably true, perhaps less so in larger herds, but uh, probably true here as well, um, that, that whatever system you use, it's not necessarily pure and to the exclusion of all others. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we we not surprisingly, uh, this kind of work is tough to do. We found three herds who had mostly been managing their herd off of synchronization as the majority tool for managing repro um, for several years prior to the study. But all of them were starting to get curious about whether activity system might work or be suitable for their herd. And so what we talked them into was basically splitting their herd in two. Um, as I'll show you in a minute, these were herds milking three to 500 cows. And so essentially what we did was split the herd in two. On one side of the feed alley, the cows were wearing um, heat time, the SCR activity tags. And on the other side of the herd, they were not. And they were being managed with uh, a sink program, primarily. All of these herds separated their first lactation animals from the rest. So to avoid confounding our treatment with, um, with parity, we ran it for six months and then switched over. That, that's a big morning, I can tell you, to lock up the entire herd and move all those collars at once. Um, but so we switched, that was a crossover halfway through. So the whole, each herd ran comparing these two systems head to head for a full year. So we got seasonal differences and, and all in the background of the study. Um, this study has the strength of the fact that it was a real world comparison in real, real herds with sufficient numbers of cows to make statistical sense. That's a strength. A weakness, or, or at least a caveat, is that it was a real world uh, study. And so we found these herds that were willing to run these two systems in parallel for a year, uh, but we weren't able to completely dictate how they managed repro in their herd. One point of which is that they kept on doing visual heat detection in the whole barn all the way through the study, which is what they had done before. If it, they were going out to do sink shots and they saw a cow in heat, they bred her. If they were bringing cows to the parlor and they saw a cow in heat, they bred her. And they kept doing that through the study. So that, that, that's either a strength because it reflects the real world or it's a weakness, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that again. Um, and these are three different herds. So we've got herd A, B, C. You'll see them coming through a few more times here. Um, they were what we would 
basically consider to be well-managed herds, healthy herds, for the most part reasonably high producing herds or certainly not below average anyway. Um, if you're, I didn't translate this into pounds, but multiply by two and add 10%. So that's almost a 30,000 pound herd on a mature equivalent basis. Um, that'd be a 20,000 pound herd and so on. Um, not surprisingly, you know, cause and effect there. Those guys melt three times a day, the others two times a day. Uh, their minimum number of days before which they would breed a cow was similar, around 50 days. Um, these guys only bred, did inseminations once a day. The other two herds did them morning and night. Anyway, so the point is, it's real world stuff, and, and you're going to see that this probably matters. Um, also, the exact details of the program that they used for first insemination, uh, they weren't really ready to change that, so, so that's a little other background difference. Uh, to be honest, I don't think that really confounded things, but that is there as a, as a possible background difference. Okay, jumping straight into the results. We ran these herds for a year. It was basically a cow level study. Um, in terms of the foot race to pregnancy, so we've got these, all these cows in this herd over, over a year, and if we look at starting from the day that they were put onto the system that they were put on to, um, how quickly did they become pregnant? Now, j just as an aside, this is not exactly days open in the sense that zero is calving, because remember when we switched over and when we started, there were cows in the pen who were, whatever, 100 days, 200 days in milk, still not pregnant. They went on their system and you know, did or didn't get pregnant the next day, the next month, and so on. So it's days to pregnancy, not strictly speaking days open, but I'm not sure you need to worry about that because our question is, relatively speaking, did one do better than the other in terms of making cows, more cows pregnant sooner? Um, so AHD, the red line, that's automated heat detection. TAI is timed insemination, remembering that there's this background of some heat detection in both herds. So statistically and, and overall across the three herds, they were not different. One was as good as the other in terms of how quickly they got cows pregnant. But statistically and practically, there was an it depends, a statistical interaction. Things were different between the herds. And that, that's going to be a theme throughout here. It was not the same story. And, and actually, to, to cut to the end, that, that's probably a, a point for take home as well, that exactly how well these tools perform relatively from one herd to another depend. And we're, we're not even totally sure of the, all the things they depend on, but there's an it depends here. It's not necessarily one answer for all. So here we go. In herd A, that was the largest of the herds, it really was a dead heat. I mean, there was no, one, one was not better than the other, nor worse. It was absolutely a dead heat. Um, I should, just so I don't forget to say it later, as you can imagine, there were a lot of things, you know, they weren't feeding the same rations and so on. There were things that differed between the herds that we didn't measure or, or couldn't measure. One thing that we did measure was lameness in these herds because that might very well confound uh, how well uh, they, they express activity. As you might guess, there was a, a variation in lameness prevalence among herds, but that actually did not uh, statistically influence our results. And for what it's worth, uh, this herd had the lowest prevalence of lameness of, of any of the herds. In herd B, um, the results, there, there looked to be, so a statistical tendency if you want, there looked to be a bit of a difference there, uh, which seemed to be spreading further apart in, in favor of the activity system as time went by. And in herd C, the activity system looked more consistently better than the timed AI-based management program. So it depends, it varied from one herd to another in the big picture of time to pregnancy. Um, if we drill down into this a little bit, a little bit further, again, there was that variation that it depends from one herd to the other. So there they are broken out, um, and again, just with one of the many possible things that might have contributed to those differences. The other thing I'll underline is, um, remember that they kept on doing some visual heat detection, and that's what this column here represents. So that's the proportion of the inseminations that were done according to the assigned Program. So in other words, in this top herd here, 
Um, 70 in, in the automated activity pen, 70% of the AI were actually done based on automated activity. In the timed insemination based pen, it was actually only half of the AI. So that there was quite a, a chunk of them that were actually uh, bred based on observation. And so on down the line. Not as quite as stark in the other herds, but there was still a bunch of heat detection going on here. Whether that was a good thing for the herds or not is, is a little bit of a tangent question, and it's not obvious that it was, but in any case, um, we'll drill into that a little further in a second with this. So that begged the question of if they had been really strict about this, if they had only um, bred off of the timed insemination program or only bred off of the activity alerts, and, and so we're stripping out all those AI based on observation, this is what the foot race to pregnancy looks like. And the red got lost somewhere coming across the border. But um, the, um, if anything, the activity system looked relatively better. The interaction was still there. So that it depends between the three herds was still present. Herds B and C, it was, it was more clearly um, advantage activity. In herd A, it, statistically, it still wasn't actually different. But for what it's worth, um, if anything, that, that difference was magnified when we stripped away the, the visually detected heats. So, I mean, when, an, when a cow gets pregnant is the most important thing, but if we want to dig a little bit into um, the, the component pieces of that, if the cows were all bred off of a sink program, you would expect to see a perfect stair-step pattern in when they got inseminated. We already know that wasn't the case. And in fact, again, overall, almost surprisingly, given that cows could be found in heat um, essentially as soon as their collar went on, um, it's almost surprising that there wasn't a difference, but, but there really wasn't overall in time to first insemination. And again, if we break that out by herd, um, it was truly a dead heat, no difference at all in the first two herds. The third herd did a little bit more of what you might expect just based on principles, which is that because cows were not if you will, waiting to finish a sink program to get inseminated, but could be inseminated throughout uh, the days as they came into heat. In fact, there was uh, an earlier time to insemination in the activity group. If we followed that on, um, looking at the repeat services, because again, in principle, if you breed a cow and she doesn't get pregnant, she should come back in heat three weeks later. And Furthermore, she should show a heat, and furthermore, the 24-7 system should detect that as opposed to waiting for a preg an open diagnosis and then re-enrolling her in a sync program. So in theory, you would expect that um, an activity-based system would have a shorter time um, from one service to the next. But again, overall, that didn't turn out to be the case, partially because both groups were confounded by um, this bit of the curve here, where cows were being um, found in heat by visual observation. You can still pick up the stair step of cows being in, um, found open and re-enrolled in the sink program, but not nearly to the degree, the degree you would if that was the pure and only system. Okay, so again, same story. Um, ironically, uh, well, we have more power here for one thing, but if anything, these cows in this particular herd were getting bred a whisker earlier off of the, the timed AI, um, but I take these with a few grains of salt. The other thing was that when semen went into cows, the probability that they would be diagnosed pregnant did not differ based on how they came to be bred. And again, that perhaps goes against what you might expect. Theoretically, if you find a cow in a standing heat, you might expect her to, do, uh, to have a better probability of pregnancy. You could argue that sometimes with sync programs, we accept a little slippage there in the interest of, of inseminating every cow, which is still to the benefit. But 
for what it's worth in this study, there was absolutely no difference between heats found by the activity system, heats found by people looking at cows, and uh, cows synchronized for timed AI. Of course, there were differences between the herds, but not relative differences between the ways cow ca cows came to be bred. So, again, I think the strength of this is that it's one of the few times we had large numbers of cows under real-world conditions putting a couple of management options head-to-head. -head. But there's the caveats that I've already talked to you about. I think we can conclude from it that Activity monitors are a viable tool. They, they certainly, the management based on that was clearly not worse and in some cases better. We still need to learn more about exactly what drives that. You know, to, to, to kind of perhaps oversimplify this, is your herd like herd B or like herd C or like herd A? And what could you expect in terms of relative performance if you choose to invest in this tool versus a different tool, a different way to manage your cows? I think we, we still need to learn more about what drives some of those differences. Um, so in the last couple minutes, I'll, I'll just take a, a couple minutes to talk about some other things that are, well, they're on the market now, but are a little more, uh, a little newer. Um, so one other tool that may become an adjunct to finding cows in heat and perhaps uh, managing based off of these automated detections is rumination. So um, a, a person whose genius I admire, I've never met the man, but who figured out that you could build a microphone to measure rumination in a cow despite all the background noise. Um, I doubt he'll ever get a Nobel Prize, but he'd get my vote. Um, anyway, these, these tags are now commercially available. Uh, they use a microphone to tune into the sound of a cow chewing her cud, essentially. And it's been well validated in independent research that that really does measure rumination. So they're, they're, they work as far as that goes. Um, Rumination is not quite the same thing as feed intake. I mean, yes, if a cow eats more, she chews more on the way down, she chews more when she burps it back up, uh, but, but it's not exactly a surrogate measure of dry matter intake, particularly in fresh cows. Um, there are things, just like with activity, there are things that influence whether a cow ruminates more or less, other than her diet and her health and so on and so forth, which are the, the, the things we're trying to detect the variation on. For instance, when cows are heat stressed, they ruminate less. Well, duh, but that, that's going to influence how we interpret the data coming out of these systems. So again, the, the pretty picture of what this is supposed to look like, um, as an example, so we've got um, rumination in purple and activity in green and the the concept here is that when cows come in heat their activity and these are sort of standardized zero is her average so we're looking at when she comes in heat there's a nice big spike activity goes way up and rumination goes down relatively speaking it doesn't go down as much she doesn't you know, only eat 5% of what, or, or sorry, ruminate 5% of what she would have, but there's a detectable drop there. And so the point is just kind of stay tuned. There's a little bit of data on this, but this may be one other piece of the puzzle that could help to find cows in heat in an automated way beyond activity. Um, there's a little bit of research now that's coming out on this. Uh, this is from Germany. What they did here was put these tags on cows and, and what they did was to look specifically at heats that resulted in a pregnancy. So they, they, were, they used that, if you will, as their gold standard to say, yes, this cow really was in heat. It was, it was the real deal as opposed, that was their way of avoiding that potential pitfall of basing things off of scanning ovaries or measuring progesterone. The cow came in heat, she really got bred in the real world and she really got pregnant in the real world. And so then they sort of retroactively looked at, um, well not her activity, but rather her rumination um, specifically. So sure enough, um, this is the, the day of, of a heat that actually resulted in a pregnancy. Sure enough, rumination dropped. This is in absolute minutes of rumination per day. So cows will typically be ruminating somewhere around 400 minutes per day with quite a bit of variation from sort of 350 to 550 and, and outliers beyond that. But ballpark figures the cows are, are ruminating um, four, five, six hours a day. 
and it drops. It starts to drop just a little the day before heat. There's a very detectable drop on the day of heat and then it comes back. So, so on the one hand, this is something that could be used to find cows in heat. With the caveat that um, what all of these numbers are trying to say is the, the absolute amount of rumination varies from cow to cow, just like it does for activity. The average amount of rumination varies from herd to herd. And the absolute difference, or as I'll show you in a minute, the relative difference of one cow compared to herself and how much her rumination drops, it's not nearly as dramatic as, as is the increase in activity. The point being that this is maybe a little bit harder to, uh, to use and so there may still be some work to do to work out the mathematics to use these data fully. And so that's just making that point is, um, in terms of relative decrease, we're not talking about two, three, four, five-fold differences like we are with activity. We're talking about 10, 20 percent relative changes. The point being that's harder to pick up because that's more of that falls within or close to normal variation. There's, if you will, there's a little more, no pun intended, noise um, in, in the rumination uh, detection. But it, it, it is detectable and that may be something to, to stay tuned for. And there's some slight differences by parity. Last but not least, one other piece of data that, that is coming into this that's also uh, this time from a different supplier. but. It, on the, around the question of what could we augment activity monitoring with, well, cow's lying behavior changes when they come in heat as well. So when a cow comes in heat, her activity spikes, we've seen that, um, and her resting time, the amount of time in the day that she spends lying down, that can now be measured in an automated way, and that drops. And so again, that potentially can, can be built into the math to say, is this cow in heat today? How accurately is she in heat today? Maybe even uh, when should we breed her? So that, 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 is those, that system is also out there commercially, uh, but stay tuned. That's, these adjuncts are probably things you're going to hear more about uh, quickly in the next few years. So to wrap it up, um, I, I mean, I think as is often the case, farmers are uh, uh, you know, smarter than some of the fussy professors and other advisors who are looking at new things in the sense that many people are already voting with their feet and their, uh, with their, feet and their wallet, wallets to say that these are a viable tool. I think that's pretty clear. Um, our little study for what it's worth would say that they're a tool that is, should be in the toolbox. They're at least as good as some of the other tools. Um, but because the, the relative performance is going to vary herd by herd, then the economics will also vary herd by herd. Um, and finally, there's still, we're uh, almost drinking from a fire hose of the data that can now be generated with sensors and monitors from cows and our ability to process those both mathematically and Practically, um, it is, we're, we're almost running behind our ability to generate data, and so there's still a little bit to be learned about exactly how often do we read and interpret the data, how often do we react to it, and um, one other is wh whether the degree to which some sort of hybrid program is necessary or useful to pick up cows that never show a heat because they really never did or because they didn't get detected um, for whatever reason. That's likely to be a minority, but they, they still need something done for them as well, somehow. So I uh, thanks for coming, taking the time out for this, and I'd be happy to take some questions if you have any. Okay, so the question was um, specific that herd A where we didn't really see much difference in repro performance. Um, there, I mean, I can take you back to the slide, but um, their days open, I mean, it, it was a dead heat. And again, I can't, I can't tell you, you know, this herd's preg rate was that or their days open was, you know, 120 or 30 because that wasn't exactly the way we measured it. But for what it's worth, relatively speaking, I mean, it was just 
absolutely not different. Yep. So, yeah, the question is, have we done the economics on this? Uh, the, the answer is not yet. Um, I, I'm, we're, we're working on that. Um, the, the tool that, uh, just to, to take something you could go home and hammer on your, oneself, the economic tool that Victor Cabrera and uh, Julio Giordano have online, it, it's, you, you got to torque it a little bit, but, but their latest version of that spreadsheet, which is on the um, uh, UW website, can be used to, to do this. You got to, yeah, torque it a little bit to force in um, heat detection plus a little something else, but it, it will work for that. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how many cows are not detected by the monitor? Uh, no, I didn't say that because we didn't exactly measure things that way. I, I hope to be starting a study very shortly where we will go after exactly that question with some progesterone measurements to actually validate, you know, if a, cow's not, if a cow does not have an activity signal by X days in milk, is that because the system somehow failed to detect her or because she truly never, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to throw out a number while the cameras are running, but, but there will certainly be a slice of cows who, uh, let me turn it around to a number I can stand on. 20% of cows, on average, have not ovulated by nine weeks postpartum. Okay, that, that, that's very repeatable across a large number of herds. So we probably need some way to find them and do something for them because Yes, just wearing the monitor longer, some of them will just start to cycle over time, but the, the, the meter's running on repro for them. I, I was going to, yes. Does anyone other than Dr. Eicher have a question? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. You had a slide there of dates of birth growth. Yes. Okay, so uh, what, what the question refers to this, I think, um, which, to, to paraphrase a little bit, is, is that it, it, what it shows is that they were probably not very compliant with a sync program, which is absolutely the case. What I didn't do for this graph was strip out all the detected Doesn't heats. But so so if, if, I'm, uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, and I, I, I don't have data on a slide to show you, but of the cows who received an insemination based on synchronization, um, I, I, I'll say sort of qualitatively that I think they really got their shots at the right times over the 10 day period. So that there was, but what they didn't do was stick to it necessarily, right? So it, uh, we had anywhere from a third to as many as a half a cows that never finished their program or maybe never even started it because somebody saw the cow in heat and bred her. But they didn't do this. Because well, if they bred her, that would have moved the curve to the left, wouldn't it have? Um, remember, this is not like days from voluntary waiting period. This is days from the day we started the program in that half of the, in that pen. Like how could any cow get past 21 days if they're on sync mode? Um, because... Because there are cows in there that were already bred and waiting to be found open before they got re-enrolled on their on their sync program. Okay. So in that leg time, you count them from. It was t zero is the day we initiated the program in that pen. So there, yeah, there were cows. You can see there's a a drop off there, but th there were cows in there that had calved yesterday. There were cows in there that were bred yesterday. And so they're not going to be bred 21 days from now. 
Oh, okay. No. So the question is, what do the cows that were not found in heats? And, and thank you, I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, the, the system that we had was that cows could go until um, past 85 days in milk, and if they had not been, and if they were in the activity pen and not detected, they would then be enrolled on a, a simple OVSYNC program. S no, they're in. They're in. And similarly, if a cow went 45 days after her last service and had not been found in heat in the, in the activity group, she then also um, would go on a sink program. And, uh, and they're in. The, this is all, uh, for the nerds in the crowd, this is on an intention to treat basis. Everybody's in. So, so they got their activity up until 85 days in milk, but if they failed, then they went on the sink. It, they got two, if you will, two cycles to be found in heat aft, after a service uh, with the activity, and if they weren't, then they went on a sink program. And so that's part of where some of the noise comes. But, but that, uh, so that's ugly for the stats, but it's what happens in real herds, right? You're, you're not going to, this isn't religion um, where you don't know she's on a, this program and I shall not drift from it. Um, and that, that comes out to, we kept score of every single insemination. We knew whether she br was bred today because she was sunk or whether she was bred today because the system said to and so on. Um, so that is, is that very clean breakout. These others, um, you know, like, like, that are, are everybody mixed together. And that's why it's, it's a, I'm talking about comparing management programs based on, um, yeah. I think there was, oh, yep, a couple in the back, yep. Oh, right. So, so the question is, but how often was the data looked at and, and re responded to? Um, so these, the system that was in place at the time of this trial, the, the tags were read optically when the cows came to the parlor. So in herd A, that meant three times a day. In herd B and C, it was twice a day. So the, they only got the data at milking time. These were not wirelessly transmitted tags. Now you can get those, but that's not what we used here. So it was milking time data. Um, I, I couldn't tell you how often they went and looked at the box, but obviously from end of first milking till the next milking, nothing changed, so there wasn't much point looking at it. Herds B and C looked at it and acted on it morning and night, after morning milking and after, after evening milking. Herd A just looked, just act, I don't know whether they looked at it at night, but they only acted on it in the morning. Who was on the list this morning, got bred this morning, and see you again in 24 hours. Um, I speculate that that's, that did not help the relative performance in that herd. But, I mean, if, I, if I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I, I would speculate that, 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 twice a day optimize the timing of, of, of AI. So if, if I had to take a shot in the dark and somebody said, you know, how should I do it, that, that's probably what I would suggest. But that's where I'll fall back to. There's a lot we still need to work out. Um, at, formally, is, is doing that twice a day actually better and worth your time and effort to do it? And then now it, the question gets even more complicated because when the data come constantly, um, does that mean you should be, you know, looking at it three times a day or four times a day? I mean, obviously at some point there's a diminishing return. It's just not worth it to 
run back to the semen tank for the fifth time today, but I, I'm not sure we know exactly where that point is yet, so that's, that's a stay tuned. We're, we're working on that. Um, so, so the question is, there's, there's systems now based on, on body temperature monitoring, um, and, and how do they look? Uh, in, in a word, I don't know. I'm not aware of any published peer-reviewed data on how accurate body temperature monitoring is for finding cows in heat. I, I, I do know that people are working on that, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing those data too. Um, th th I mean, physiologically, there are changes in body temperature Around, that, that are associated with ovulation. So the, the principle uh, is sound, but how well the systems work under field conditions, I've not seen any published data on that yet. Um, so the question about accuracy, again, sort of, you know, you could say relative to what, but Okay. Yep. So in the field study, we did not. Uh, I mean, other than in terms of conception, the, someone put semen in the cow and she got pregnant or she didn't. Um, we, we, sorry? We, we use the default settings in the system in terms of the threshold for a signal that the cow was in heat and the producers got that signal. Basically, it shows cows in heat list this morning and they, they would act on that. So um, we did not assess accuracy based on did she actually ovulate, was her progesterone actually low at the moment they bred her. Not in this study. In that slide I showed you near the beginning where with the table of, of, of various studies looking at the sensitivity and specificity, that, that's what they did. And, and again, we actually have a, a, a proposal in to, to go after that piece of it on a large scale as well, but haven't done that yet. Okay, we are uh, actually over an hour. Um, I did want to mention to everyone to please fill out your evaluation forms, leave them at the back desk. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, there's a number of vendors involved in this area out. Please visit their booths also. Uh, I know that Dr. LeBlanc uh, told me beforehand he's got a shuttle to the airport to catch in just five or ten minutes, but I'm sure he'd be glad to uh, catch any individual questions here in the next five minutes if you have any. Uh, and again, thank you for coming. Okay. And uh, yet uh, is uh, uh, working with the uh, automatic. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah, sure. Thank thanks. You. Good. Okay. Have a good day. Yeah, thanks. Nice to meet you. Oh, hi.